right, we get it. People like big, meaty villains in their content, like Thanos or Darkseid. But haven't you heard that brain is better than brawn? Muscles are nice and all, and everyone would love to have a chest like a cheese grater, but there's no substitute for the old grey matter. Strength and physical power might win someone a fight, but intellect can win someone the war. That's where this lot comes in. TV history is littered with all sorts of evil geniuses attempting to misuse their gifts for their own selfish needs. Criminals, gangsters, thieves, con men, the very lowest of the low, are often the ones with the highest IQs. But who amongst TV's evil elite would make it into a bad guy version of Mensa? Which villains have come up with the best and biggest plots in the land of television? Well, that's a good question. So, I'm Ellie with What Culture here with the 10 smartest villain plans in TV shows. Number 10. Pulling the strings, Joe Carroll in the following. Usually, in a TV show, a villain story comes to an end as soon as they're caught by the good guy and thrown into jail. In the case of the following, this is where cult leader and serial killer Joe Carroll's journey begins. A former English teacher, Carroll was put behind bars for murdering 14 of his students. The man who sent him away was former FBI agent Ryan Hardy, played by Kevin Bacon. Catching killers, dancing, selling phone contracts, is there anything that man can't do? Carroll's intelligence and charisma allows him to amass a group of fanatical followers from inside his jail cell. Whilst incarcerated, he orchestrates a series of terrible events in order to escape prison, reunite with his wife and mentally torture his captor. The plan brilliantly toes the line between intricate and complicated, never straying over into unbelievable. It also plays perfectly to Carroll's strengths as a persuasive leader. It doesn't end well for the criminal. He gets blown up outside a lighthouse at the end of the first season, but you know what they say? It's the thought that counts. Number 9. A load of trash, the Soprano family in The Sopranos. As Tony Soprano himself says, the waste management business has often been associated with the mafia. The city of Naples underwent a crisis of uncollected waste due to the illegal involvement of the famous Camorra crime organization. The mob would get paid to collect the waste and then dump it, often failing to correctly separate regular garbage from more toxic industrial waste. This real-life phenomenon is reflected in TV titan The Sopranos, in which the titular family run a fraudulent trash disposal business called Barone Sanitation. Let's just say that the garbage isn't the only thing that stinks about Barone. The business is obviously a front, used by the syndicate to launder money to fund their more illicit operations. You might think it's a bad idea for a mobster to play up to such a stereotype, but that's where the beauty of the plan lies. Nobody suspects the Sopranos because what they're doing is so obvious. Trash collecting isn't Tony's only hiding spot for dirty cash, he also owns a deli and a strip club. Wow, for a guy who rags on stereotypes, Tony sure does like to use them. Number 8. H. Ian Buckles in Line of Duty The identity of H in police drama Line of Duty was water-cooler chat for years amongst British TV fans. The one-lettered mystery man was the final member of a group of corrupt police officers with ties to organised crime. Fans of the show spent years trying to work out who H was, only for him to be revealed as Detective Superintendent Ian Buckles in the show's finale. Beginning his career as a lowly constable, Buckles rose through the ranks of the Central Police Force to one day become the Big Boss. All this while secretly assisting a massive criminal organisation in bringing chaos to the city. That's right, the setting of Line of Duty is just called The City. They really aren't very original with their names in this show. Buckle's plan was brilliant. He kept a fairly low profile on the show, slowly climbing the greasy pole, gaining more and more power as he went. It was flawless. Well, right up until he got caught, that is. But it took a really long time for this to happen, and he gained a lot of notoriety in the process. Just think of the book deals when he gets out of prison. Number 7. Destroy All Humans, John Cavill in Battlestar Galactica Set in a far-flung system of planets, the excellent 2004 reboot of Battlestar Galactica is about the last survivors of humanity after a deadly war with a group of androids called the Cylons. The grand irony being that the Cylons were created by human beings in the first place. That would be like people today being wiped out by a bunch of sentient toasters. 
John Cavill is the Cylon head honcho, the very first one ever made and model number one. There are also loads of him as he spreads versions of himself out across the system. The first Cavill takes the form of a priest and infiltrates the titular ship by offering religious counsel. Once his identity is discovered, he soon becomes more unhinged and more dangerous. Much like the dictators he is based on, Cavill uses his words to persuade others to join his cause of wiping out humanity. By explaining the human race's many faults, he is able to convince people that they should be destroyed and replaced with a more advanced robotic race. Keep an eye on your washing machine, folks. It might be out to get you. Number 6. I Run This Town, Al Swearingen in Deadwood if you're currently mourning the loss of Westworld, then Deadwood from 2004 to 2006 might just plug the gap. Set in the 1870s, the show charts the rise of Deadwood from small settlement to bustling town. At the centre of the action are two characters, both of whom are based on real people. There's Timothy Oliphant as Seth Bullock, the town's sheriff, and then there's Al Swearingen, the conniving owner of the local bar played by Ian McShane. Sporting a moustache that could kill a man at 20 paces, McShane's interpretation of the character was as vile and disgusting as the language he frequently wielded. From the comfort of his gem saloon, Swearingen had his fingers in many different pies and manipulated the events that went on in the town to his advantage. In the first season alone, he has multiple people killed, sells someone a fake gold claim, and bribes various members of the legal system to swing votes in his direction. Al's plan is extremely simple. Keep Deadwood under his control through a combination of services and threats. It's simple and effective, and it makes him a very powerful man. Number 5. Who's the Real Brain? Pinky in Pinky and the Brain for those who don't remember Pinky and the Brain, the premise of the show, as Brain explains at the beginning of each episode, is two lab rats trying every night to take over the world. The Brain would often lead the way with a high concept scheme, but he would never be successful, and this was often due to the well-meaning interference of his cage mate. In the episode Pinky's turn, Brain decides to let his friend have a go, thinking he'll just humiliate himself. He doesn't. He really doesn't. Pinky decides to open up an oyster petting zoo in a small town, which soon becomes so popular that he is declared mayor for a day. He then changes the town's name to Shiny Pants, which attracts the attention of the world's media. He then becomes head of a global news network before eventually becoming appointed the head of the Federal Reserve by Bill Clinton himself. This sounds mad, well, because it is, but the point is that Pinky's plan was way more successful than anything Brain ever did. The taller mouse showed more serious foresight and confidence in waiting for this scheme to come to fruition, or he was just mental. We'll never really know for sure. Number 4. Into the Timeline, The Great Intelligence in Doctor Who in his many thousands of years saving the universe from alien nasties, the Doctor has amassed plenty of enemies. They've all tried and failed many times to take him down, with one of the most inventive plots against him coming from the mind of Richard E. Grant. First introduced in the 2012 Christmas special, Grant's version of The Great Intelligence becomes the main antagonist for the seventh series of the revival of Doctor Who. He gains access to the Doctor's time stream via his grave on the planet Trenzalor, jumping inside it to undo all of his past victories. Now, it's one thing to beat the Doctor one time. Plenty of villains have done it, but he's always bounced back in one way or another. What better way to stop the Time Lord from returning than by making sure he never did anything good in the first place? The Great Intelligence's plan wreaks havoc with history, until he is eventually stopped by Clara. Even though he was unsuccessful in his endeavours, the Great Intelligence still came up with one of the most original and devastating strategies to take down the universe's greatest saviour. That would explain his name, I guess. If Doctor Who is something that you are very interested in, then make sure that you check out our sister channel Who Culture for lots more Doctor Who related content. Number 3. A Smooth Operation, Gus Fring in Breaking Bad Gustavo Fring from Breaking Bad and later Better Call Saul is one tricky customer. Once a lowly immigrant running drugs from the Mexican cartels, Gus eventually became one of the most feared and ruthless drug barons in the southern states of the US. Through his chain of chicken shops, Gus is able to both launder money and transport huge amounts of methamphetamine across the border into America. He's also got a laundry business that doubles up as a meth super lab. Whilst the business side of Gus's operation is genius, it's his public persona that really makes him stand out. 
He presents himself as a charitable member of the community, making donations to local organizations including the very same DEA branch tasked with taking him down. His friendly exterior hides a dark and vicious streak, ready to kill anyone within range of the nearest box cutter. Cool, calm and collected, Gus rarely ever lets his emotions get the better of him. He knows that he must keep a level head for the sake of his empire, and the one time he doesn't proves to be his downfall. Number 2. Sozin's Comet, Fire Lord Ozai in Avatar The Last Airbender If you're going to take over the world, you're going to need some serious firepower. Or an oyster farm, as Pinky proved earlier. This is literally what Fire Lord Ozai gets in the series finale of Avatar The Last Airbender. The tyrannical leader of the Fire Nation, voiced by Mark Hamill of all people, times his assault on the Earth Kingdom with a very special cosmic event. As Team Avatar discovers earlier in the series, Ozai is awaiting the return of Sozin's Comet, which enhances the ability of all firebenders. The demented leader wants to harness the comet's power to raise the world to the ground and rebuild it in his image. Waiting for a celestial vessel that gives you superpowers that only you know about is pretty smart. If those pesky teens hadn't also discovered the comet's existence, then Ozai would have surely been successful. Those meddling kids… hang on wait no that's a different one. In the end, Ozai does fail and even has his bending taken away from him by Aang. Still, he was very close and we should all praise him for that. Just try and ignore all the death and destruction he brought upon the world. Number 1. Intimate Confessions – Peter Baelish in Game of Thrones We could have included a number of different plans from Game of Thrones in this list. The Lannisters' ambitions to steal the Iron Throne, Elena Martell's murder plot against Joffrey, Melisandre's manipulation of Stannis, but we've gone for one that's a little more subtle but still highly effective. Although still the son of a lord, Peter Baelish's family was not one of the great houses of Westeros. However, after becoming ward to House Tully, he grew his social stature and eventually became the king's master of coin. That's not the only thing he was in charge of, as Baelish also set up a series of brothels around King's Landing. Good wholesome family fun, that. What better place though to catch people off guard than when they've literally got their trousers round their ankles? Baelish used his network of sex workers to extract secrets from the most powerful people in the capital, growing his own influence as a result. From relative humble beginnings to one of the most secretly powerful men in the land, Peter Baelish's rise to the top was as despicable as it was brilliant. He might be little finger, but his brain is anything but tiny. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed something, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day, and I'll see you real soon.